Hey guys, in this video, I'm going to teach you how to play the brand new Keepers in Iron faction for the game Root. Now, the Keepers in Iron and their counterpart, the Lord of the Hundreds, are going to be in the new Marauder expansion, which should be releasing in early 2022 to Kickstarter backers and retail shortly thereafter. Now, I, of course, don't have this faction physically yet. I printed out all the components and I'll link into the description where you can print out your own copy, but it works really, really nicely. Leader Games have been very transparent with all of their stuff, but I am going to be using the Keeper, um, the Eerie Dynasties Warriors as a substitute just for the Warriors. I had to put five of the Eerie Warriors away because the Keepers and Iron only have 15 Warriors. But first, let's do a little uh, faction overview for them. So thematically, they are a knightly chivalric order of badgers who are going throughout the woods to try and collect these relics. These are lost relics from wars of the past that they're trying to either steal or uh, recover and put them in a museum or something. It's a little bit hazy, but that's neither here nor there because they are a ton of fun to play. They are a faction of Reach 8, so they're the same as the Duchy, which is really cool because that means you can make lots of different combinations in games either without the Cats or without the Eerie. Really, really nice to have another high Reach faction. They battle a lot, and they're very interactive. So I've populated the board with these Cats as the sort of dummy enemy to interact with. Let's look at their components first. So. They have 15 warriors, like I said. They have 12 tokens, the most of any faction so far. So they have tokens of three different types. These are their relic tokens. They have um, jewelry, tablets, and figures. So those are the three kinds of relics they're trying to get. And there are four of each type. So let's take all of the tablets as an example. So all the relic tokens are double-sided. So if we turn them over, you can see a number. There are two threes, one one, and a two. And this goes for every other type of uh, relic. It's always one, two, three, three in terms of the value. And this value is gonna be very important because when you recover a relic, you get the victory points listed. So three victory points is the most you can get for a relic, usually. We'll talk about that in a second as well. So 15 warriors, 12 relics, and three buildings. So the buildings are called way stations. They are your crafting pieces. So you only have three of them, but as you'll see, they're very flexible crafters uh, nonetheless. And if we look at one of them, you can see that it has a little symbol, which is the type of relic that you can recover in this place. And you also have in the bottom corner, a symbol that tells you what's on the reverse side. So at this way station, you'd be able to recover jewelry relics, but on the opposite side, you have the other one. Now you cannot recover the reverse side. This is just a hint. This is just telling you what's on the other side, and that helps for managing the way stations. And you'll see why when you actually start to play them. It really helps to know what the reverse side is. Importantly, when you have a way station on the map, you're not just allowed to flip it over at will. You just decide which side it's going on when you place it. And we'll talk about placing it once we actually get to the steps of the turn. But they just go right here. It doesn't really matter where they go, but they go into these slots, okay? The last bit of the components that are different for them is the Faithful Retainer cards. You have three of these, and they act very similarly to the Loyal Viziers. Now, you've already noticed these columns. This is going to be their action system that's very similar to the Eerie Dynasties, but uh, when you actually play them, you'll see that it's very, very different. So, you have three of these. They are birds. So it's birds in armor, and as you see the text, it says, when you discard this card, remove it permanently. So uh, unlike the Eerie, that will keep the Loyal Viziers even if you go into turmoil, uh, these guys don't go into turmoil. There's nothing about them that has that mechanism. But when you lose one of these cards, 
it's completely just removed from the game permanently. There are three of them, and at the start of the game, I'm just going to do this right now. It's part of the setup, but it doesn't really matter. You get one per, and as you see, they're bird suited, which is very nice. This faction really cares about bird cards. Okay? So that's their components. Now let's talk about their setup. Okay? So the first thing you're going to do is take all of their relic tokens, all 12 of them. You're going to shuffle them all together, face down, of course, so that you don't see the value that's on the other side. Just give it a couple good riffles. And then you're going to put one in each forest. Remember that the river does not divide forests, so this is one forest. Boom. They're totally random, so it doesn't matter if you get a little cluster of them, that's fine. Then we're going to take the rest of them that we didn't place yet, we'll just put them aside. Now for the sake of simplicity, I'm just going to choose the opposite corner, so we're using classic setup, not advanced setup, uh, opposite corner from the keep, and you get four warriors in that clearing. Okay. Now, next you're going to take another four warriors and place them in another edge clearing that's adjacent to the first one. So we're going to put them here. But I could have chosen here, it's also an edge clearing. I would not be able to put it here because it's not an edge clearing. So yeah, I'm just going to put it there with this one cat guy. Now you're going to take the remaining relics that you did not place out on the map and you're going to place the second relic into each of the forests, starting with the ones farthest away from your setup location. So we're gonna put one here, one here, one here, one here, and one here, just to keep them as far away from the starting setup uh, clearings for the keepers in iron. Otherwise, it would just be too easy to get lots of relics right at the start of the game. All right, they're gonna to have to start moving out and away from them, okay? Then, of course, they have zero victory points to start the game. No favorites here. And three cards for their starting hand. And that's the setup. Now let's run through their first turn. So, uh, I'll, I'll talk about their abilities a little bit later. First, let's just talk about Birdsong. So, first thing is in camp. Once per turn, you can replace a warrior with a way station once per clearing. So you remove a warrior and you replace it with a way station. So we're gonna put it right in here. Now you can you don't have to rule the clearing in order to do this. It's not a build action, it's just replace. Okay, so as long as there's a warrior and an empty building slot and no no keep, no corvid snares, you can put a way station in that clearing. Now it's once per turn per clearing, so I'm gonna encamp here as well. I'm gonna take a warrior out, and I'm going to put another way station right in that spot. Now I would not be able to encamp in this same clearing again for a third uh, time, just because it's once per clearing per turn. So that's that, I can do it twice at most on my first turn. The second step is decamp which, as you might guess, is the exact opposite. You replace a way station, put it back on the board, in order to get a warrior in that same clearing. And again, you can only do it once per clearing per turn. So if I had two way stations in the same clearing, I could only do it once. I'm not gonna do that, however, because I just encamped it. What would be the point? But that's how it would work, but my goal is to have two way stations on my first turn. So I'm not decamping this turn. Next is Recruit. Recruit is you spend a card to recruit two warriors at a matching way station. So I could spend this fox card and put two warriors in here because it's a fox clearing with a way station. So I would just get to recruit two warriors there. And that's my turn, or that's my bird song, I should say. I'm actually not going to do that because I would like to save this card for something else, but that is how Recruit would work. And that concludes Birdsong. Next we move on to Daylight. 
the first thing they do in daylight is they craft. So let's look at our hand of cards. We have uh, oh, one of each, something that we can craft with one rabbit, one fox, or with one mouse. We have a rabbit crafter, the way stations are crafting pieces, and one fox. So I could craft either or both of these, but I'm not going to, but that's how they would craft. You save these cards for some other reason, you'll see later. But crafting is over, now we move on to the retinue. The retinue is the main part of the action system for the Keepers in Iron, and it works, like I said, similar to the Eerie's Decree. So, we start with the first column, which says move. Now, just like the Eerie's Decree, you can do it in any order if you have multiple cards, but I only have one, so I'll just take that one action. Now, like I said, it's not mandatory. It's optional. You just may take the move. And of course, again, like the Eerie's Decree, it's move from a matching clearing. Thankfully, it's a bird card, so I can do any kind of move, but let's say that it were a rabbit, I would be able to move these guys out into any of the adjacent clearings. But because it's a bird card, what I'm gonna do is move these two warriors into here. So that's my move. I'm all out of cards in this column, so I'm gonna go on to the next column, which is must battle, then may delve. Now the main function of this middle column is to delve, which is to take relics from forests and pull them into the adjacent clearings, okay? Now, I would like to delve this relic. So I could actually take the delve action in any of these clearings because they're all adjacent to the forest. And if it were a fox card, I would have to choose one of these two. It's a bird card, so I'm going to decide, uh, let's do it right here, just to demonstrate a battle. Now, when you delve, you have to first check and see if you have a valid target for a battle. In this clearing, there's no enemy pieces, so I would just be able to do a delve action, take the relic, pull it in, and not have to do a battle at all, because there's no one for me to battle. But I'm gonna execute the delve in this clearing instead. So I check, is there an enemy warrior? Yes, there is a cat. So I have to battle the cat if I wanna delve. Battle the cat. Ooh, it's a one, one. So I would remove the cat, and then I take the loss. Bummer, I lose a warrior. But now the battle is done. Now I may delve. Now in order to delve, you have to have a warrior left over in the clearing that survived the battle, and you have to rule the clearing. So those are the requirements. Rule the clearing and have a, at least a warrior there after the battle, if there was a battle, which I do. I satisfy those conditions, so I get to do the delve. I'm gonna take this relic and I'm gonna pull it into the clearing where the delve is happening, and then I flip it. And it's a three. Ooh, a lot of points. So what I do now is I check the number, which as you can see, is three. So it's worth three points if I can recover it. However, I have to check how many clearings around the forest where it came from do I rule. One, two, three. Cool. If I rule equal number or more clearings as the number on the relic, nothing bad happens. That's totally fine. But let's say that I did not rule this clearing. I only rule two, and it's a three relic. Because the number on the relic is higher than the number of ruled clearings around the forest where it came from, I would actually have to discard the card that I used to take that delve action, and because it's a faithful retainer, it gets removed from the game permanently. But fortunately, that did not happen, because I ruled all three, that's why I, I chose to delve this one, so I get to keep my card. Try to manage your delves in a way that you don't burn cards from your uh, retinue so that you can take lots of big turns with lots of actions. Now, important note, even if I lost this card and I had to uh, discard it because the number on the relic was too high, I would still get to keep the uh, relic, all right? The, the delve survives or the delve succeeds. It's just that the card is what I lose, nothing else. But I've taken my battle 
or my delve in battle. And now I move on to the final column, which is move or recover. Recover is where you actually get to take the relic from the map and bring it to your player board to score the points. But you can only do that if you have a relic at a matching way station like this. Currently, I don't have that because my way stations are here, my relics here, so I can't recover this turn. That's fine. What I'm gonna do instead is I'll just take a move. Now, uh, it's move or recover, I can't do both. The battle then may delve is like a two for one, so I was able to first battle then may delve. I cannot move then recover, it's move or recover. So I'm gonna move this warrior this way. However, let's take a look at one of the abilities, which is Devout Knights. When moving, you may move a relic with each Keeper Warrior. That's right, these are the first relics that actually are mobile. So when I move this warrior, he's actually gonna carry the relic with him, boop -ba -doop -ba -doo, as he takes the move. So now, he's over here and he moved the relic with him. Important note, it's one relic per warrior. So if I had two relics here and only one warrior, I'd only be able to move one of them and I have to leave the other one behind. But fortunately, I had one relic, one warrior, so I move it all together. And now that concludes my one and only action in this column. My retinue is complete. So now I move on to evening. The first thing we do is live off the land. Now you check all of your clearings where you have warriors. If you have more than three warriors in a clearing, you have to remove one. So it's sort of a measure that prevents turtling. So let's say that I had four warriors here in this clearing. I would have to remove a warrior because it exceeds my three uh, capacity, right? So three is the safe number. If, let's say, I had something crazy, if I had six warriors, it's not like I removed three. You always only remove one for live off the land. And now I'm down to five. It's just if you're over three. So four or more, you have to remove one warrior. But they were not here. That was just an example of how it works. So let's just put that all aside. Okay, back on the supply. That is live off the land. Next, you get to gather retinue. Now this is really cool because unlike the Eerie that can only put in one or two cards into their decree at the start of their turn, and only one can be a bird card, there is no limit to how many cards you can put into the retinue. So I can take all three of these cards and put all of them into the retinue. So let's, uh, let's do that. Let's put one into recover. One into battle. And why not one into move? Okay. Now, when you do the gather retinue action, you have a choice. You either do what I did, which is put any number of cards into the retinue in any column, or you can shift one card. So let's pretend that I didn't do that. Let's just reset the retinue how it was. This is my hand. Instead of placing new cards into the retinue, you can shift, which is you take one card from any column, one, and move it to any other column. I don't know, we'll put you over here. All right, when you do that, you can rearrange cards in your retinue. However, you're not adding new actions, so your action economy isn't really growing. So I think that that's not the best thing to do, especially when I only have three cards. So we'll put those back how they were. Rabbit move, fox battle, then delve, fox move or recover. And that is it. However, unlike the Eerie Decree, which is limitless, you can only have 10 cards in the retinue maximum. So once you're at 10, you can no longer add more cards. You can lose cards by either delving or recovering when the number isn't right. And we'll talk about how to lose cards from recover later. But for now, we're not at our cap, so we're not worried about that. Then we get to the final step of evening, which as usual is draw cards. You draw one card plus one for every one of the symbols that's revealed for way stations, right? So I have two way stations out, which means I have plus two cards. So that's one plus two, 
I get to draw three cards. The Keepers and Iron have fantastic card draw abilities. Ooh, ambush and a bird card. Nice. We'll put those over here. And that concludes the first turn. Now let's just take a quick dummy turn for the cats. Perfect, that's the cat's turn. You already know how to do that. Next, let's do another turn as the keepers in iron. So, again, encamp. Now I can encamp here again to put a second way station in this clearing. So let's do that. Boom. Uh, yeah, we remove a warrior and then we place a building. And this time I'm gonna put a figure way station. Right? I mentioned this, when you place it, that's the moment you decide which face that you're going to place it on. Okay? Then next I'm allowed to decamp. Let's, uh, let's decamp this one, actually, because there's... I have a plan, I think. So, we're going to remove this way station to place a warrior. So, that's another way of kind of recruiting, is by decamping or by doing the standard recruit action. Then we get to recruit which is, oh no, undo, Never mind. let's pretend that didn't happen, shh. Okay, now we'll get to recruit. I'm gonna spend both of these cards to recruit, which means two warriors right here, and then another two warriors in that same clearing, so two per card. So now I've got a big hulking stack of badgers. Uh, yeah, then I get on to Daylight. Do I want to craft this boot? Absolutely not. Bird cards are super important for this faction because they allow you to take more flexible actions. Okay, so we'll skip crafting. We'll move on to Act with the Retinue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to move this warrior with the relic into here just because I want to demonstrate something. And then I'm going to, like that was my rabbit move, right? I moved from rabbits. I'm also going to move these four warriors. One, two, three, four. Here, okay? And those are my two moves. Now I move on to battle then may delve. So I want to do a... A battle in this clearing. There's nothing for me to delve, but I just want to demonstrate something. So, let's talk about the other part of Devout Knights. In battle, ignore the first hit you take if you have a Relic and a Keeper Warrior. So in this clearing, I have now a Relic and a Keeper Warrior. So I can battle the cat. Let's pretend it wasn't a zero. Let's pretend it was a, I don't know, three. So I get the three, he gets the two. So I knock out the cat because I have enough warriors. However, that first hit, the first and only hit that they would normally deal against me is blocked by my devout knight's ability. So I don't even take any hits here, which is nice. So they are a very defensive faction, hence keepers in iron. As you notice, they're all wearing armor. So it's almost like they're really tough warriors as long as they have something to fight for, which is the relics. All right, so that's my battle. There's nothing for me to delve, so I'm just gonna skip that. And then I'm going to do a battle here in this fox clearing. So let's battle the cats. 3-0, oh man. Take out all three kitties. And then, of course, I may delve. So why don't we take this relic here from this forest, because of course it's adjacent to where I did the battle. Take it, and we flip the number. Oh, it's a three. Okay, well, I still get the relic. However, because I only rule one clearing around this forest, right? I don't rule here, 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 or here. Unfortunately, I have to lose the card that I use to take the action. So now, it's very important to declare at the start of the battle, which card you're using, because there could be shenanigans. No, you said it was the bird card, whatever. So just make sure you say, I'm using this fox card to do this, because now after the battle, of course I'd rather lose this fox card than my faithful retainer. So 
discarding the Fox card. And like I said, even though I'm discarding a card, I still get to keep this relic, okay? Next, I get to move or recover. And I can move from Fox or from Bird or recover in Fox or Bird. So what I'm gonna do is, uh, I'm gonna move this one guy with the relic back down here. And that is my bird move. Then I have a fox action and I'm gonna use it to recover. So here I have a, you see, I have a relic with the jewelry symbol and a jewelry way station. So I can recover this. And what's interesting is you don't even have to rule the clearing where it's happening. You just have to, even if I had no warriors and someone else ruled it, you can still recover. That's not a problem. So I'm gonna take the recover action at, with this Fox card and I'm gonna take this relic and place it over here. So it's now safe, I've claimed it. I get three points for that. Pow, nice. However, just like with Delve, there's a mechanism that can cause you to lose a card. However, now, Forests aren't involved at all, so I have to check the suit. So it's a fox clearing. I have to check if I rule three, because that's the number on the relic. Three, it's my cat. Meow. To check three fox clearings. I don't, because I only rule two fox clearings. That means I have to discard this card, unfortunately. Oh no, but that's okay because I still got the relic and the three points, but that ends my move and recover column. So my retinue is now finished. So let's switch over real quick to the winter map because I wanted to show a very uh, close up example of how recover works. So recover is obviously the method of getting the relic tokens from the map onto the player board where you, they're now worth points and they're safe from the enemies. But the action works a little bit differently from Delve. So if you remember in Delve, I don't know if you can read that text there, but it says that after the battle is concluded, if there was one, you have to rule the clearing and you have to have a keeper warrior in the clearing in order to successfully Delve a relic. Well, Recover is a little bit easier to do actually. Well. Let's take a look right here. In this clearing, I've got a tablet relic, uh, two tablet relics actually, and two figure relics, as well as the figure way station and a tablet way station. Now, I don't actually have to rule the clearing where recover happens. Let's go ahead and read the text exactly. Take any number of relics of the same type as way stations there discard this card and stop action if you rule fewer matching clearings than a taken relic's value. So what that means is you don't actually have to rule the clearing, right? The cats actually have rule over this clearing at the moment. However, doesn't matter. I can actually just go ahead and take them and score the points for them. But as soon as I don't have enough matching clearings, to satisfy the numerical value of the relic, I would have to lose the card and stop recovering. But you can actually recover multiple relics in the same action. I'll show you how it works. So first we have a fox card. Oh, there we go. We have a fox card and a bird card in recover and we're already set up. So let's go ahead and take a fox recover action. So we're in a fox clearing. Now, uh, do I rule the clearing? No, but it doesn't matter because I am taking a one relic, and as long as I rule one fox clearing, I can go ahead and take it, not lose the card, and recover another relic in the same clearing as long as the way station and the relics match. So I'm gonna take that relic, score one point, all right? And that's fine because you see here, I rule one fox clearing, two fox clearings. Perfect, that means that I can now Hmm, look at this two. So here, this is a figure way station or a figure relic. I have a figure way station there. Remember, the action is per clearing, not per way station or per uh, relic type. So it's totally fine for me to also recover this relic 
using the exact same Fox action that I used to recover the first one. I score the two points and then I check. So it's two Fox clearings. Again, I rule two Fox clearings, so I don't have to lose the Fox card that I used to take the action in the first place. And I can carry on recovering another one. Now here's a little bit tricky. I have another two relics, but they're both of value three. I only rule two Fox clearings, so I would actually have to lose the card if I decided to recover one. But let's go ahead and do it. Actually, before I continue, look what just happened. I completed a whole column of relics, which means I get two points for that. But let's go ahead and also continue this recover action and take this um, tablet for another three points. One, two, three. However, now because I only rule two fox clearings and the number on that relic was three, I have to discard this fox card that I used to take the action. And then I'm left with one more bird card in recover. You know what? It might be worth it. Let's do it. Let's take this as well. So we're using this as a bird card and of course birds match fox. So we're gonna go ahead and recover this relic as well for another three points. One, two, three. In fact, it's, it's actually, you can't even see it on the camera right now, but I'm, and then you get another column bonus because I completed another column. So now I'm at 17 points. So I believe I was at four points at the start of this turn and now I've just jumped up to 17. So the Keepers in Iron, although it doesn't happen very often, they are capable of these massive point bursts turns. Now, the way that it started, of course, is that all of these four relics were in this clearing undefended. The warrior wasn't needed to actually complete the recover action, but if the cats decided to attack, that would have been worth one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten victory points for the cats had they attacked all these pieces. Because remember, prize trophies, uh, each of these relics is worth two points. But that's fine. We recovered them, so they are now safely on our board, and no one can take them from us. And that is how the recover action works. You can get many, many, many relics in the same action. However, as soon as you recover a relic that has a value that's higher, in this case, I actually got a relic that was higher than the number of fox clearings, so I'd have to discard this card as well. But it was worth it because I just scored 13 points. So that's how recover works. Now, move on to evening. Again, live off the land. I check two, three, three, no problem. I don't have to lose any warriors for live off the land. Now, gather retinue. I'm gonna take this bird card and I'm gonna put it into recover right there. That's gonna be fun. And then draw again. Of course, I have all of my way stations out, so I get to draw one plus three. So that's four cards I get to draw for this turn, which is really nice. Oh yeah, more bird cards, and this time I can probably start crafting some of this stuff, because now I have five cards in my retinue. So we're approaching our cap of 10. Once they have seven or eight cards, they're fully online. Now, that's pretty much it for their actions. You understand most of the abilities and actions of the Keepers in Iron. Let's just go over a few other things. So we've talked about the Devout Knights, which is how they have the defensive bonus, both in attack and defense. And it's where you see that you can move with your relics. Let's say that I wanted to attack this cat. Uh, let's make a little stack of cats right here. Okay, I'm gonna attack right here. If I attack the cats here and they play an ambush on me, Devout Knight still blocks the first hit of the battle, which in this case comes from the ambush. So I would only lose one warrior instead of the two. Okay, but then when I roll, let's make that one. Now I don't get another defensive bonus for this same battle. So now that one that they rolled removes one of the warriors and I get to still remove only one. Okay, so the defensive bonus works both attack and defense 
and it blocks the first hit of ambush, but after it blocks the ambush, then it doesn't help you again for the rolled hits. Now, another thing is prize trophies. So prize trophies is a bit bad. It's just how these relics work. If an enemy destroys a relic, so now let's say the cats wanted to attack and remove this relic, it still goes back to the forest. However, two important things. It goes back to any forest that they choose so they can take it after they destroy it and move it over here, put it far away from me, or they could put it here if they wanted, make it really a headache for me to go back and get it again. So that's bad enough. The other thing is that when enemies remove it, they get the one victory point plus an additional one whenever they remove the token. So it's actually worth two victory points when they remove the token. So be careful about your relics because they are the juiciest target for your enemies to attack. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is their comeback mechanism. So let's say that you've been essentially board wiped. You have had all of your warriors and all of your way stations removed from the map. What now? Well, there's a, a little comeback mechanism that says in, in camp, you may replace a keeper warrior with a way station, which is what we did. But underneath it, it says, if neither is on the map, put both in a clearing on the map edge. So that's a really great comeback mechanism because it means that you get to take a way station of your choice and a warrior and place them on a map's edge clearing. So we're gonna put them both right there. Boom. Now, that's our encamp action for this turn. Of course I could decamp as well if I wanted to, but I think I'm gonna keep it because then once I get to recruit, look at that, I got two mouse cards from my previous turn. So then I can spend both of them to recruit two warriors each. Now I'm all the way back up. So if you board wipe the keepers in iron, they have a really strong way of getting back on the map and getting a lot of warriors fast if they have a full hand of cards, of course. Okay, now, uh, the last thing that I want to talk about is their scoring. So, of course, they get the value printed on the relic, so this one would give them three points. However, let's say that they went on to recover this relic, worth two points. One, two, and then they went and got themselves a figure, which is worth, this one is, two points again. One, two. Once they complete a column, so one of each different ones, they get an additional two points, which is really good. So that kind of incentivizes them to not just focus on one kind of relic because they get column bonuses every time they fill up a whole set of unique symbols. All right, so that is basically everything that you need to know in order to play the Keepers in Iron. They're a little bit tricky, but they're super fun to play once you figure them out, and it's a really interesting puzzle. It has a lot of what I love about the Eerie Dynasties, but they're also really burst scoring, so they can potentially score eight or nine or 10 points in one turn, especially if they have a whole bunch of cards in their hand that they can maybe craft, and a lot of different actions in the retinue. So it's a very engine building kind of faction, which I really like. So give them a try. Uh, if you have any questions, you can ask them in the comments, and I hope to hear from you guys and hear from some of your experiences soon. Good luck, and thank you very much.